The road ahead for China when it comes to imports and trade deals. What's next for the global economy? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. In a year when most countries around the world are facing tough financial times due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Chinese market could be the answer to kickstart economies around the world. With a population of over 1.4 billion, China has a huge consumer base. The country is opening up for foreign companies and products, and for the third year is holding the China International Import Expo. CGTN Sui Huo has more from Shanghai. This year's event is 14% larger in scale and attracts most of the world's top companies despite the pandemic. Chinese President Xi calls on all countries to learn from the pandemic and promote opening up for win-win cooperation. The pandemic reminds us that all countries are a community with a shared future and no one can stand alone in the face of major crises. We must adhere to the concept of win-win cooperation, prioritize the common interests of all countries, and promote economic globalization in a more open, inclusive, balanced, and win-win way. The week-long event provides a window for recognition of foreign products and gives domestic consumers more choices. President Xi said over the next 10 years, China's import volume for goods and products could exceed 22 trillion U.S. dollars. China is a huge market with the greatest potential in the world. Made in China has become an important concept in the global industrial supply chain and has made positive contributions. China's vast domestic market will continue to stimulate its potential for innovation. President Xi said going forward, China will continue to improve its business environment, boost innovation, and deepen bilateral and multilateral cooperations with countries in the rest of the world. I'm sure that China will remain open to the world in terms of trade. That's very important for Denmark. It's very important for the world. If we have to get the wheels back in motion and, and, and leave this tragic of the pandemic, that we need to trade and we need to continue to focus on our trade. And I'm sure and I hope that China will keep on following this track. And I think that CIE is a proof of that. So we are CGTN, Shanghai. To talk more about international trade, let's bring in our experts from Beijing. Aina Tangan is a political and economic affairs commentator. Joining us from Miami, John Quelch is dean of the Herbert Business School at the University of Miami. Ryan Patel is a global business executive joining us from Los Angeles via Skype and also via Skype from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Gilson Schwartz is a professor of economics at the University of Sao Paulo. Welcome to all of you. Aina Tangan, let's go to Beijing to start this. Um, China is becoming a bigger and bigger importer, and this is a bit of a change from what we used to here. I mean, if you walk down any big box store in the United States, you'll see everything's being made in China, but now China is importing stuff. What is the significance of that? Well, China has an outward face to the to the world. I mean, in the in the beginning, it was all about uh, production, uh, trying to go from literally zero economically to where they are today. Forty years of success, though, have changed the environment. It's a dynamic situation now, where China has to give back as well as uh, producing. So you can expect, uh, with twenty two trillion dollars over the next ten years over uh, on the line, uh, a lot of companies going to be interested. One very telling fact. 75% of the uh, companies that were surveyed said that they intend to increase their footprint in China, and that includes 70% from America. So it shows the power of markets. Uh, Ryan Patel, uh, of course, the world's economies are reeling right now from the coronavirus pandemic, many countries facing recession. But the Chinese economy has shown growth. We saw that last in the third quarter, and the IMF, in fact, is telling us that they expect growth in China to be just over 8% next year. Uh, how might this fuel uh, a world recovery? Well, with China, you know, if you look at their economy, at least in the last three quarters, or expanded positively, although maybe, maybe a percent, but compared to everyone else, they are in the positive. And I think part of what China will have to help drive um, is their ability to be open in their partnerships. I think that is really how China will play in the future, because if you think about it, they have recovered 
the fastest when it comes to the pandemic. And when I talk about what is the potential, it's not just opening up in the digital economy and internet. I mean, they're we're, they're talking about you know early signings of the regional comprehensive economic partnerships and speeding up in kind of negotiations of the China and EU investment treaty. I mean, this is where China can come in and be in a position uh, to be able to be that resource for many of these companies that are trying to reel back and recover and be the catalyst for it. Ryan, when you talk about China uh, needing to forge relationships or partnerships, uh, tell us more about that. Spin that out for us. Yeah, I, th this is, you know, compared to two years ago now, the pandemic hit, let's just be honest, it opens and changes the game. So China, as you, is, is the question before, is they understand that they have to import more for the future. They understand it's not just about domestic production, that they have to rely and make investments outside of China. So they've realized if they want to get back to the path of the top economy in the world, these partnerships are having to create win-win situations, but also advantages for, for them to ensure that they can maintain that. Uh, John Quelch, we know that there are continuing trade tensions between China and the United States. It's been there for several years right now. Uh, what is the chance that these tensions could ease as we see China become a bigger market for American produced goods? Certainly the uh, size of the Chinese market is formidable and uh, uh, in a sense the Trump administration uh, attempted I think unwisely perhaps to try and uh, put a break on the expansion of US-China trade uh, in both directions. And to some extent through the tariffs they actually succeeded in that. Uh, they did reduce the total volume of US-China trade and they also reduced the trade deficit. But perhaps not by enough to warrant the sacrifice in political capital between the two countries that resulted from uh, this relentless focus on uh, trade and tariffs. So what I would expect uh, to see in the Biden administration uh, is a, uh, a less aggressive approach on this particular front. Um, superficially, the two, uh, Biden and Trump, pretty similar in terms of the rhetoric on China policy. But when it comes to the actual implementation, I think you're going to see much more multilateralism from the Biden administration, uh, much more outreach in terms of trade and investment flows to other parts of the world as well as to China, and uh, perhaps some degree of support uh, greater than President Trump displayed uh, for inward investment from China into uh, the United States. The United States investment in China is much larger than Chinese investment into the U.S., which has been largely blocked by uh, government regulation, um, especially with respect to te technology-related acquisitions. Uh, but I, I would expect to see some softening of these hardline approaches uh, in the uh, 2021 first half once the uh, new administration comes in. Uh, Gilson Schwartz, uh, China is a major trading partner for many Latin American economies, uh, including Brazil, where you are right now. Um, how important is the Chinese market for those developing economies? Well, the Latin American economies, especially the Brazilian economy, have been much dependent on the exports of raw materials, agricultural products. So there's been some deindustrialization in Brazil, as a matter of fact. And, uh, well, the rhetoric of the government that has come to power two years ago is uh, very strongly anti-Chinese. It was very much aligned to President Trump uh, rhetoric, uh, some kind of automatic uh, lineup with the U.S. Uh, but on the other hand, there's been lots of pressure from sectors such as agriculture, exporters, who, of course, have a very clear horizon of improving the relations with China. So I also believe that there will be a softening, a pragmatic softening of the position of the Brazilian government. And uh, I also expect that under the Biden administration, the China-Brazil relationship will again come to the fore as just another very important strategic partnership rather than a situation where you have to align automatically to the U.S. Ina Tangan, uh, John Crouch raised an important point there a moment ago, uh, talking about the 
new Biden administration, we could possibly see a change in tone, but do you think that could translate into significant policy changes in the relationship between the two countries? Yes, uh, and I think it's necessary. I mean, the, uh, the, the whole tariff thing was a massive failure. I, I, I would disagree with John on the statistics. Uh, right now, um, the, the uh, U.S.-China trade deficit is 25 percent higher, uh, and you can put that on COVID, but there was not a long term. Basically, that entire amount was being foisted by the U.S. consumers, contrary to Donald Trump's claim that China was paying for it. And now with this technology war going on, there's $150 billion worth of uh, high-tech goods which are sold by U.S. companies. If those disappear and China becomes self-reliant, uh, those people will be out of jobs and the profits from those uh, activities will not be available for research and development, putting the U.S. further behind. So there has to be a pragmatic angle to, uh, to do this. I think Biden has said already he intends to compete from the top rather than the bottom, which means rather than trying to trip China up, he's going to try to outcompete China by putting more money and more emphasis onto technology development. Ryan, uh, Chinese imports have actually risen for the second straight month. Um, and, you know, we often hear President Xi Jinping talking about a win-win scenario. I mean, could this go some way to reducing the kind of protectionist tendencies we've seen around the world recently? Well, yes, right? I mean, they, they understand that the China understands the opportunity. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, even in, out of this expo, you saw China's driving the luxury market to recovery. Prior to the pandemic, everybody was talking about that specific sector, how China has the lead, um, even from the e-commerce, and using the, the amount of people that... China has to its advantage. So to your point, if you stay closed in a situation where everyone's still recovering, because China is still recovering, and so is the rest of the world, you lose out on opportunities. Um, and that's why I think it's very interesting to see how this expo played out on how that rhetoric is to create openness. And again, it's one thing to have rhetoric, and I think for every country, then it becomes an execution on these trade deals. And it's important because businesses and leaders they're, they're not sitting in the sidelines. They are focusing and trying to figure out what is the next revenue stream, and, you know, and China wants it to be a part of their revenue stream. John Crouch, during the uh, Trump administration, we saw a very big focus on intellectual property, on things like technology exchanges. Uh, is that going to change, you think, under a Biden administration? I don't think so. I think uh, some of the underlying issues uh, that the Trump administration raised around uh, intellectual property protection, around uh, um, subsidies to uh, state-owned enterprises, et cetera. The, these are all still uh, unresolved issues following the uh, phase one trade deal. And I would expect the new U.S. trade representative in the Biden administration to be uh, focused on those as much as uh, uh, Representative Lighthizer has been during the Trump administration. Uh, so I don't expect to see much change there. I mean, it's certainly the case that um, as China has become a more innovative economy, more enterprises in China are themselves looking for IP protection uh, domestically from uh, uh, local competitors. And uh, so as the innovation flow and the technology flow has increased in China, uh, foreign companies have benefited from the protections that have uh, come into place for domestic companies. And, and the, the, the innovations in the investment law uh, include uh, tighter controls uh, supporting uh, IP rights. And so I think, um, I think it's still going to be an issue, but, uh, you know, perhaps uh, mitigated by domestic uh, technology, technology developments. Okay, I want to take a break, but before we go to a break, I want to get Ina's view very uh, quickly, Ina, on what you've just heard about these issues on intellectual property and technology. Well, China's come a long way, and I, I do agree with uh, uh, the com uh, John that at this point, China has a lot of skin in the game. They, um, you know, Chinese companies uh, create more patents than anyone else in the world. And as a result, they have this impetus to do this. But quite frankly, if, I, you, know, if you talk to an intellectual property uh, lawyer today, they'll tell you that you're probably going to get a fair shake in China than you would in the US. And that's virtually just because it's a much speedier process. You're going to get to where it is. It's uh, much more factual. There's less chance of uh, kind of pushing it around legally and trying to crush your opponent 
uh, on that level. So, you know, China is moving ahead. Uh, it has the market. It's just this, this intellectual property thing and also this idea that somehow uh, China is the only one who's subsidizing uh, state-owned enterprises. Look at Boeing. Look at Airbus. You know, they've been uh, criticizing each other. The only thing we know for sure is that both countries have been subsidizing their national carriers uh, for defense and other reasons. So, you know, the hypocrisy of that is at some point going to enter into the equation. Okay, time right now for a break. There's plenty more to discuss, including China's relationship with the developing world. Stay with us, you're watching The Heat. CGTN. The world's currencies are more connected than ever before. The mechanisms that drive the economy are universal. Money moves markets. We explain these trends and show you how the cash in your pocket can have a wide-reaching effect. Because money makes the world go round. Global Business. Welcome back. We're talking about China's International Import Expo and the country's market for foreign companies. Let's get back to our panel right now. And Jilson Schwartz, I want to talk to you about something you mentioned a moment ago, and that is exports from the developing world to China. I mean, if you look at Brazil for an exa uh, as an example, uh, most of those exports here that so far have been commodities, primary commodities. Um, do you see that changing? Do you see uh, consumer goods, manufactured goods going back to China? Well, it's uh, much more difficult. Uh, due to a number of conditionalities and competitiveness issues. But on the other hand, it must be stressed that there have also been some Chinese investments in Brazil. So there is an expectation that as long as foreign investors, especially Chinese investors, enter the country, this may open up the road towards a reindustrialization of Brazil. But uh, for what we have seen so far, the process of the industrialization has been too strong. So it's uh, rather unlikely that uh, we will be that competitive or competitive enough to enter Chinese markets with consumer goods. Anna Tangle, what role will this growing um, Chinese economy and its growing import market play in the rise of the renminbi as an international currency, as a settlement currency? Well, uh, China is the number one trade partner for over 100 countries. Uh, they're by far the largest. Uh, the U.S. is a distant second right now. So the opportunities to have direct trade, especially given the, uh, the performance of the yuan and the uh, you know, stability of China's market right now, you know, if you invest in a 10-year treasury in the U.S. because of, you know, your trade situation and you're putting money somewhere safe, you're, you're guaranteed to lose 1% of your investment over a year, on a year-on-year -year basis. So that, that's not attractive, whereas in China, you could gain uh, 1%, so, and that's after inflation. So uh, given those kind of market realities, that's why you're seeing money pouring in to China, both bond markets and also the equities. People sense that there's the, the only predictable force at this point, economic force, is China. It's the only market that's out there that's actually chugging along production unit. But I think China sees internally that there's a couple of things that they need to do. One, uh, importing raw resources is one thing, and it's very necessary to China. But in order to create a stable international trade situation, they have to give back. And that means they will have to encourage countries like Brazil, as we were talking about, not only to reindustrialize, but to produce products that can be shipped back to China on a value added basis. Right now, for instance, Brazil exports one half of the, of the coffee in the world uh, that's sent abroad. Uh, yet they you know very minuscule when you start looking at the coffee grinders and the uh, mixers who are actually making more than the growers themselves. 
So if, if Brazil was to do like France and start developing its own coffee industry and China was to buy it, this would be a good example of adding prosperity across the board at no cost to anybody, just win-win. What are your thoughts on that, Jilson? Yeah, I agree. I think that there is another issue here, and that's the environmental capital, the environmental legacy of Brazil. This has been on fire, as we know. The Amazon has been open to all sorts of invasions and non-sustainable development models, but it still is one of the largest reservoirs of nature, of uh, biodiversity, and that has certainly also an intellectual property value over the future. So I think that as long as the world comes to realize that we need sustainable investment models and also the carbon credit markets realize that there is enough density and policy support, maybe Brazil could be a champion in the area of new green deals or new markets for funding the nature or the Amazon or any other regions in Brazil where we have really large extensions, large extensions that are not cultivated, but they are maybe a reservoir of oxygen, a reservoir of health to the world. Uh, John Crouch, to what extent do you think uh, Chinese growth, uh, Chinese exports could be affected by the fact that there are a number of its very important markets, especially in Europe. We look at France, we look at Germany, we look at the United Kingdom, which are moving back into lockdowns because of the coronavirus pandemic. Certainly, uh, there appears to be a, a stop-start economy that's uh, developing in many European countries, and that's uh, uh, mirrored, of course, uh, to some degree in the United States as well, um, where we have seen uh, relaxations and then reimposition of uh, uh, curtailments on uh, uh, social gatherings and restaurants, uh, other activities of that nature. So I think the the European, the prospects for European recovery, um, while positive, are still a little bit uncertain in terms of the uh, uh, smoothness of the trajectory. Uh, in the United States, uh, I would expect to see, uh, especially after today's news with regard to the uh, uh, Pfizer vaccine development, uh, I'd expect to see a relatively smooth upswing uh, in the uh, first part of uh, 2021. Of course, the stock market is way up uh, because, uh, as has already been pointed out, there is a negative return to cash uh, or treasuries in the U.S. after adjusting for inflation. Um, so the stock market's a little bit, uh, a little bit um, high, high at the moment as a result of, uh, you know, there being nowhere else to go to invest. Uh, but I think that uh, consumption in the U.S. has held up uh, surprisingly well in the third quarter. Uh, we expect to see a strong uh, fourth quarter as well. And the U.S. consumer, curiously enough, has always seemed to come through uh, and has been, uh, despite uh, many challenges in uh, um, the dot-com bubble era, in the uh, aftermath of 2008, uh, in all of these circumstances, the U.S. consumer still remains uh, robust and uh, healthy, uh, to some extent aided by government stimulus packages, of course, but nevertheless uh, still uh, doing a fine job on behalf of the U.S. economy and uh, the global economy. But, you know, as, as has been pointed out, in the long run, the size of the Chinese market and the emergence of the Chinese middle class means that that market gains ground every day mm -hmm. in terms of comparative attractiveness vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Ryan, uh, one of President Trump's biggest complaints about China was the uh, trade surplus between the two countries. In fact, it actually widened over the past month. Uh, do you see that narrowing? Yeah, I, I actually think it will. I, I think the rhetoric, it all matters the rhetoric and, and how the Biden administration focuses it. You know, I think it was mentioned that it was a top-down approach that Biden will look at. But I think at the end of the day, we're talking about win-win situations. So for me, what does that really mean? For China's, for example, China's own development needs, they're going to have to partner creating benefits greater benefit for people in other countries, so in other emerging markets. So does that mean China wins a little less and the other country wins now in the short term and in the long term. China wins in the long term because they made that investment. I think these are the situations that the U.S. and China will have to come to together and see where do they win a little less. 
to gain the longer term play to keep the the other industry afloat. Mm -hmm. I think to me that's really going to be very interesting to see how that plays out if it's in telecom if it's in you know just you know in e-com it just there's a lot of places when we talk about innovation how every every country is trying to catch up uh just on trot um you know china's signature foreign trade or foreign development project is the belt and road initiative uh, how do you see that fit in any way into its goals to increase two-way trade between itself and its uh, major trading partners yeah, I think that's really an alternative approach to globalization. Um, we have uh, already seen this definition of a dual circulation and this extraordinary perception that both the domestic market and foreign markets must be related. There must be a balance. It seems to me that the balance also depends on geopolitical factors. And so the Silk Road is, of course, a major perspective, a long-term perspective that alters the balance between Western powers and China itself. So it's really a long-term geopolitical project. Uh, John Qualch, you know, we heard uh, from Donald Trump over the past three years when, that one of his goals was to decouple the U.S. economy from the Chinese economy. But given that there were almost 200 U.S. companies at the CIIE this year, uh, is that off the table right now? I would say so. I, I think that the, the concept of decoupling um, the genie was long out of the bottle in terms of China becoming a global force and uh, uh, the concept of decoupling was uh, not merely impractical uh, but also dangerous in the sense that first um, trade and investment across national boundaries are probably among the best guarantees for peace and prosperity that one can imagine. Um, and secondly, in addition, uh, there was just uh, too much rhetoric um, coming out of the Trump administration right. uh, and not enough hard policy grind dialogue between lower level officials on a regular basis on all sorts of issues uh, from uh, navigation rights in the South China Sea to intellectual property, which we discussed, etc. All of these issues have to be discussed regularly by officials right. on both sides. Uh, Anna, very quickly, uh, we had the world's top uh, 14 pharmaceutical companies and the top 10 medical device manufacturers at CIIE this year. How important are these sectors for China? Well, they're absolutely uh, important. I mean, this is the whole point. Uh, China is opening up. Uh, I, you know, one, one issue in this regard is you, you have Sinopharm, which, you know, has come out with 100% uh, in ter effectiveness in terms of the 24,000 people who've uh, taken it and gone abroad and not uh, contracted COVID-19 uh, versus, you know, a, a Western uh, pharmaceutical company says, oh, we have 90 percent. So, I mean, I think there's still going to be a little uh, uh, disparate uh, treatment as it goes forward. I think the real big issue here is that with the Biden administration, he's right. going to switch to political containment, whereas Donald Trump was looking at economic and security. Okay, and that is it for this edition of The Heat. Thanks to everyone for being with us. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.